Peeps, Wednesday, December 7th, 2022. A smiling guy, Adami, an equally happy Dan Nathan, who had glasses on a few minutes ago, who has since taken them off. Uh, today's episode of Market Call, and I am fired up. Brought to you by FactSet, financial data and analytics that are powered by tomorrow. I'm powered by the fact that the New York Yankees did the right thing, signed Aaron Judge to a nine-year, $360 million contract. That's Carter Braxton Worth money. Oh, by the way, Carter <laughs> Braxton Worth will be joining us in just a few minutes off that ridiculous contract. Uh, Rangers in Las Vegas tonight. Uh, I'm feeling good about how they turn their season around potentially in period three of that Blues game. How are you, Dan? I'm doing okay. You're all fired up about New so, York I, sports. I, I, I am. I love Wednesdays. It's so funny. I got to tell you, guy, I, I don't think this judge deal is a great deal. And, I, and listen, I don't know. You've forgotten more about New York Yankee baseball than I have. All I remember is all the excitement about the huge deal for a rod back in the day and what mm -hmm. followed a massive drought. When I think about, you know, judges MVP season in New York, as soon as they got focused on that title, on that, on that record, what happened to New York city uh, baseball in, in the Bronx, in the playoffs this year, it just went away, you know? And I just think he's going to be a big distraction. He's a great guy. sounds like he's a great player, obviously, but um, you know, can't let him go. You can't let a talent like that leave. You have yeah. to do what it takes to get him back. They had their opportunity in last year. They screwed it up, and they're paying for it now. I'm happy about it. Listen, we know that the back end of that contract is going to look brutal, but yeah. that's what you do here. That's the way the game is played. The market yeah. is playing a different game, though, today. Markedly unchanged, as they say. Well, except the guy, you know, like the NASDAQ, you know, we talked about it yesterday on the market call, and I thought it was really interesting that the relative, you know, underperformance of the NASDAQ is just really pronounced, and especially at a time where rates are going down. And we're going to hit that a little bit um, in a few minutes here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a tweet by, this is uh, the at Kobe. Kobasi letter. It's K O B E I S S I letter. I follow it on Twitter. Um, you know, again, I have no idea. Um, you know, I, it's a good follow. And, and so look, look at this tweet guy. And, and he sums it up. I think things still don't add out. Stocks are trading like the Fed won't pivot. Bonds are trading like the Fed pivoted. Gold is trading like inflation is 15%. Crude oil is trading like we're in a recession. VIX is trading like we're in a bull market. All of those things are true, as you would say, and they don't really add up. Like, let's just think about it. And, and, and Stephen did a nice job here. That's a, a front page of his fact set screen there. And there's a lot of red and there's a lot of green there. And so it's a confusing market guy. Yeah, you know, The Usual Suspects was a great movie, by the way, Dan. I, I'm surprised yeah. that this guy is now writing newsletters, apparently. I love that movie, by the way. That is a great movie. It wasn't Kobayashi, though. It was like no. Kaiser Sose or something. Kaiser Sose, but, uh, you know, the greatest trick that Jay Powell ever, ever yes. uh, pulled was yes. what? Was what? The it, was making, it was making the market believe he, you know, whatever. Listen, let me just say this. This is all accurate. There are so many cross currents going on. There's so many things that would... Uh, lead bulls to believe we're out of the worst of things and lead bear to believe there's another leg lower. And I think both sides can probably make a decent claim. I think you know where I stand. I, you know, I still think with the yield curve further inverting, I think with the headwinds we face from slower economies globally, I still think valuations are still too high. Layoffs are coming, all those things. And a Fed that although they may slow down, they're going to stick around for a long time. They basically told you that. So I, I think the market did exactly what it should have done. We'll take a look at a chart in a second. Uh, we topped right at that downtrend line, and now we seemingly – are headed back lower, Dan. Yeah, I mean, we broke that pretty steep uptrend from the October 14th lows. I think the S&P was up, um, what, about 17.5% or so. Now we're down a little more than 4% from those recent highs from that rejection. We're through the 200-day moving average. We'll get Carter's take on that. He's been um, charting it the whole way to the penny to the penny. And and so he's been sending out updates over the last you know week and a half or so on worth charting. Um, NASDAQ, again, you know, if you look at this thing, it never got to that uptrend. It never really tested it did not test that 200-day moving average. It has broken the uptrend that's been in place over the last few weeks. And a lot of the relative underperformance has been in the NASDAQ. And so maybe that's the thing that continues um, you know, into December as investors just continue to peel out of some of these names as they think about the top five names in the NASDAQ, which are also the top five names of the S&P. They all guided down for the current quarter that we are in. And you and I are in agreement. It's not likely a one-quarter guide down. Yep, I agree with that. I mean, and I think what you want to see, 
again, and I've said this a number of times, I think I might have said it on Fast Money last night, you need to see those five or six huge names really yeah. sort of give up the ghost, not in terms of their commentary, but in terms of the stock prices. And maybe to some extent you saw it in Microsoft a couple of weeks back, and maybe you've seen it in Facebook, but you certainly haven't seen it in Apple. I think you're starting to see glimpses of it now in Amazon. And Tesla, as you've mentioned a number of times, is basically right on the precipice here. So I think when those names finally acquiesce, which is a great word that I can't spell, you probably don't have it on your bingo card, people, too bad. That's yeah. when the NASDAQ puts in a bottom. And that probably coincides with an S&P, again, somewhere between 3,200 and 3,400, something we've been steadfast about literally for the last year. Yeah, and I, and I guess the flip side of that is that, you know, when we see, let's just look at the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. Mm. It's broken below that kind of psychologically important 3.5%. It looked like it was trying to hold yesterday. That's where it sold off to last Wednesday afternoon at Fed Chair Powell's um, presser there. And again, you know, that rising 200-day moving average is 307. The 150-day that Carter looks at is about 330. It seems like we are a foregone conclusion somewhere between there. And again, guys, shouldn't tech stocks after Act better if we have rates lower. This is something that I know Carter talked about. What he thought, and you know, I sort of echoed it and mirrored some of the things that he was saying. He thought he could see an environment where yields go lower, the dollar goes lower, and the knee-jerk reaction to that will be stocks trade higher until stocks figure out that those things happening are not bullish, and then they'll turn around. And that's pretty much exactly what's transpired. And to your point, one would have thought with 10-year yields going from 4.3% at its zenith, now to 3.5%, probably headed lower still, those high valuation, high growth tech names would have caught a bid. They have not. And I think, again, I think that's a bit of a warning sign because the market's figuring out that lower rates are not the panacea that they once were for the market. Man, can I tell you something? Sure. I should, you show, should clip. Guy. Can you clip that shit? Is that what they call that when yeah, you clip that, something? Because that was that's something that Jacob might do. Jacob might clip it for us. Brilliant. Put it out I mean, on the, the social. In there, by the way. All right, but let's let's do this. We we spent a lot of time talking about the ten year U.S. Treasury yield. You spent a lot of time talking about the two year that reflects what the Fed is doing. Um, obviously, with Fed funds, it stayed put here. You've been calling for a inverted yield curve to the tune of you got to seventy five basis points. Good on you. Uh, you think it could get uh, maybe to one. I mean, let's not, you know, looking at the 40 year chart of the 210 spread guy. I mean, we are basically, you know, we are blowing through 40 year lows. Yeah. Let's not, we don't have to get nitpicky here. At some point, that's going to turn. What is the cause for this yield <clears throat> curve that has inverted to the tune of 80 some basis points? We know that the, the 10 years coming in. What's the thing that causes the two to come in and maybe the 10 to go down? less and then you less. have less of an inverted yield curve and then what does that mean for other risk assets like stocks? yeah you know like the only the scenario that you're painting in other words for the inversion to be less steep it's going to have to manifest itself in two years coming down somewhat precipitously because i don't think the 10 years is going to go back up in a meaningful way so what are the circumstances that happens well i guess and this is just a guess if the cpi report comes in much softer than expected, you could see that kind of move, I guess, in the two years. So that's a set of circumstances that could happen. Or, you know, if you have that on top of an extraordinarily dovishly toned Federal Reserve, that could happen. Short of that, though, I think the two years can remain sticky. And that's something I've said for a while. So what I really love hearing are the pundits on these various shows talk about how it's different this time and the yield curve doesn't matter, which is complete horseshit, uh, quite frankly. It absolutely does matter. And the only thing different this time, it's worse. That's what's yeah. different, Dan. Yeah, no doubt. And you are one of the pundits on those shows, but I you am. are not but you I are not pundit. You are not echoing that thought process. All right. Before we No, Cruz, I'm not echoing that. I'm not just, I, you know, just no, I don't I, do that. I don't I just, you know, I don't follow it's the crowd. And nor do you. Not your jam. It's not okay, my let's, jam. Let's, you know, we were going to do crude together, but I'd I'm love to a, up, get man. Carter's take on a lot of what we just talked about, then do crude. And Carter has some some thoughts on uh, the transportation space, on the, uh, you know, the travel, transportation, consumer discretionary sort of stuff. So let's just bring Carter Braxton. Wow. Where you know him. You love him. Damn. He's wearing a, he's wearing a shirt that, like, I said this in the pre, you know, when we were, we were down there. 
really brings out the glue in his eyes. You see what's going on there, guy? Do you see that? His eyes are my, so my, blue that he could wear black. Do you and imagine the blue would come I, out? I suppose his eyes. someone in, in the world must think about that, but it is not. Uh, it's not you. It's not it's I, not and you. it's not the three of us. <laughs> Matching right. your something to your something. <laughs> Carter, talk to us a little bit. You've been drawing the lines on the charts. You've been doing it uh, for your subscribers or we're charting. You've been doing it on a market call for weeks here. I mean, it is astounding how it literally is to the penny. Your chart yesterday or your notice that went out to your subscribers um, was basically saying, listen, we broke that uptrend. You know, we got rejected at the downtrend on four occasions this year. Um, that really sharp uptrend that's been in place for the last, what, month and a half or so, it just broke. Let's throw that S&P chart up here again. I mean, what would you expect? You're a bit of a measured move sort of guy also. Where do you think this S&P finds some support? Because, again, you know, um, we've seen these palpitations. We have call them bear market rallies. At some point, the bear market's going to be over and it's going to kind of get going again. But where does it have to kind of bottom out near term? Or where should it find some support this this month? I mean, sorry, uh, I thought you said guy. Yes, uh, well, what we know is, it, look, it, it, so if you step back a bit and you just removed all opinion and we just were to cite facts, we know that since the peak on January 4th, we have had consistent drawdowns, sell-offs, declines, whatever you want to call it, that have been um, punctuated by counter trend moves, meaning we're in a downtrend. And so as of now, the only way to characterize the current circumstance, the October 13th low to the high of four sessions ago, is a counter trend move. And so the breaking of the minor uptrend line in effect since the low um, calls into question whether the counter trend not only is over, but whether it just means we resume the downtrend. And if the sequencing is intact, the inference, of course, is that you go to the low and you make a new low. But I think what you'll find is that we had in August at the high a massive shift there was a, a thesis going around that if you retrace more than 50% of your drop, you are in a new bull market. And that was exactly the opposite and wrong thing to do. It was the peak in August. Guess what we heard from the street three, four, five days ago? New bull. We're going to go on to make new highs. Prominent market observers making that case. I just don't think that's what we're looking at. I think we're looking at nothing other than a counter trend rally that is now faltering. Yeah, I agree with that. I know Dan does as well. You know, people will talk about seasonality. I know Doug Cass has been pretty uh, vociferous in response to that, and I agree with him. I mean, I don't think there's any merit to it necessarily. I think we've seen it from time to time. The problem is people will talk about it, and you'll hear that phrase that I refuse to utter as we get closer to December 25th. But you know, there's really no substance behind that. So I think you're right. I mean, the market does not necessarily have to rally into year end. And the headwinds have not abated whatsoever. One thing that has clearly given it up, though, um, is some new crude oil. We have a chart here, Carter. And you know, you've talked about this. I know Dan has as well. But we are at pretty critical levels here, I think, unless you disagree with these lines that we have so uh, aptly drawn. Yes, aptly drawn. I mean, there is no precise breakdown level or rebound juncture here. Um, I think the important thing is, is that we're likely to see excess uh, readings, just as we saw the excess reading in response to uh, the Ukraine invasion, when we went from 90 to 130 a barrel in six sessions, up 40 percent. Uh, we're now seeing the equal and opposite, meaning people abandoning crew thinking. And so uh, my hunch is lower. And how much lower? I, I just don't know. But I think the most important thing, of course, is to be underweight energy uh, shares, being underweight the XLE relative to the SPY or just outright. You're getting a lot of damage done <clears throat> relative. Yeah, you know, it's Carter, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, I, and again, when you're looking at charts and you're doing your work across, you know, many different risk assets, I mean, you're not really factoring in, you know, qualitative kind of judgments that people are making, the sort of headlines that people are saying. You made the point that on many occasions when crude, you know, got above 100, you know, like the targets of 150, 200 by all the, you know, commodity strategists and all the major banks started coming out. And there's the exact time to start thinking about taking the other side of that. Here we right. are. We're down, you know, like many stocks in the market. 
that were overvalued a year ago. You know, crude is now down about 50 percent or so from, you know, a little less from those year ago highs. And so, again, these sorts of patterns, this sort of sentiment that works its way through markets, it doesn't really matter what risk asset, whether it's an unprofitable tech stock, a crypto, uh, a commodity like crude. I mean, sometimes you just have to start being a bit contrarian when everyone's going um, one way. You know, that one year chart again, I, you know, I just drove that little support level because that takes us back to the 52 week lows. And, you know, at some point this thing's going to get oversold. There's going to be a headline that, that causes um, a sharp rally. But, you know, you had a note out, Carter, a couple days ago on worth charting and it was about Airbnb. And again, I know that you were doing some work because you and I were talking about it on some of these consumer discretionary travel sort of names. And when you look at some of the price action that you're seeing, it kind of actually helps make the case for crude, which really means less demand. Talk to us a little bit about an Airbnb because because it falls in the category of kind of high valuation tech that saw a pull forward during the pandemic. It's seeing a bit now. Well, actually, it saw an absolute disaster during the actual you know throes of the pandemic. But then we saw the roaring 20s narrative come out and people with all that flush with cash, that sort of thing, traveling again. This is a bad chart. You put this out a couple of days ago. Morgan Stanley downgraded it again. They're seeing weakening demand into a weakening economy. You know, how, what is this chart? Essentially, this is since it went public. And the next point of reference, once it goes to those 52 week lows, was at $68 IPO price in late 2020. Yeah, I mean, it's just a stock under pressure. It's in a downtrend. And regardless of how one draws the lines, I've drawn them this way. Uh, that way is another way. You can see there's a, a, a declining a wedge. If you look at the next iteration, we're breaking down from key levels. And most importantly, we're right back to the June low. And um, you should get some backing and filling at the June low and then ultimately work lower, which then puts the IPO price in play, which is much lower. So you're essentially at all time uh, lows here. And the group, if you look at things like Expedia and, and, and Booking and others, um, and they're all interrelated, uh, you know, it's just it's not good. Now, a downgrade can move a stock, as is the case today. Um, but as is so often the case, it's and it's not this individual's fault or that individual's fault. They're, they're simply adjusting to the price after the fact, right? The price target for the, the analyst downgraded, they had it up at 100 and something and they, they lowered it to 80. But yeah. when your price target is 110, the stock's already 92. You got to do something. Guy, guy, talk to me a little bit here because Carter just mentioned Expedia. Maybe they can pull up like a five-year chart. Earlier this year, the stock was making new all-time highs. It mm -hmm. traded as high as $217 in late February. This is after tanks were already rolling, right, from Russia into Ukraine. I mean, what the hell were investors thinking, right? You know what I mean? When you think about it, because we also <clears> saw <throat> that's when crude oil started to spike. I mean... You know, this is just a great encapsulation of the really shitty narratives that make themselves you know, apparent during, you know, in, in Wall Street, you know, wh whether it be, you know, brokerage houses trying to support different thesis and that sort of thing. And based on strategists and estimates that aren't going to come down until it's too late. I mean, like this is a disaster and this is a profitable company. It's yeah. a great company. You know, COVID over, China reopen, um, people did that pent up demand to trip, all those narratives were in play. I mean, I can remember some of the things that were being said at the time, obviously, that didn't manifest itself. And you, know, you go back to Airbnb, this was the A in my dawn trade, probably this time last year. And you look at it now, obviously, that didn't play out particularly well, but this is still a stock now, even with this move lower, that's probably trading close to 30 times next year's EPS probably trade six or seven times, you know, revenue. It's it's not cheap even here. So, yeah. you know, in an environment where people are focused on valuations and valuations actually do matter, Airbnb is 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 feeling the brunt of it and to a certain extent Expedia as well. And those narratives obviously that a lot of people were hoping were going to play out then did not. Yeah, but let me just make one point for some of us who, who basically like to take the other side of some things. I mean, right now, you know, Expedia, which is a profitable company, maybe 2023 estimates are way too high, expected to do $9 in earnings. That's up 30% or so year over year with, you know, revenues expected to be up 12%. It's trading at 10 times earnings. This is a company with a $15 billion 
enterprise value versus let's say an Airbnb with a 51 billion. So you're telling me, right? Like that an Airbnb that only <laughs> is a marketplace for homes, you know what I mean? For travelers is going to like, and you think about all the gross merchandise value that Expedia has trading at that valuation and an Airbnb, when you think about its valuation trading at a multiple of sales, which is still pretty fat at about seven times, um, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be some great opportunities. I'd much rather buy an Expedia at some point than I would um, an Airbnb. But Carter, you know, today we're seeing even with crude down, you would think that maybe airlines would be acting better. There were some headlines out of some airline CEOs, United in particular here, talking about potential for a slowdown. These are also cheap stocks. Talk to us about the Jets, um, which is the ETF that tracks the airline um, group here, because again, it's obviously pretty related to what we're just talking about with hospitality and uh, Airbnb and such. Right. I mean, the, the important circumstance, again, is that it makes its low um, early. I mean, we know the S&P makes a low on October 13th and the Jets is actually in the tail end of September. But the lines as I've run them here, and you can draw the lines anyway one once, what I see is, is a break of the move from the low. We, another iteration is if you make these parallel sort of, you know, and, and you can go back and forth. The point is that it's um, it's not a, a good one-two setup to have great strength. And you're talking about, what, 15 to 19, uh, huge percentage gains that then you start to give way because does it, does it mean that it stops after one day sell-off? No, you usually uh, get a lot more. Now, does it have to do what the other two instances did, which is go on and make a new low? No, but there's nothing about this setup as depicted on the screen right now, that says buy it. It says either don't touch it or try to short it. That's exactly right. And, you know, I've been one of these people that's been trying to make a compelling case for some of these airlines on valuation. And listen, more than a few times, that's been the right call. But, you know, overall, they have not traded particularly well. And you look at that chart that Carter just put up and it speaks volumes. I mean, you've had moves to the upside along the way but each one have been rejected and you continually make these series of lower highs and lower lows. It's not a particularly strong pattern. And I, quite frankly, Dan, I don't know what breaks us out of it. We have a quick question from Peter McGrady, and this is interesting. This is sort of to you, Carter. And I don't know if there's necessarily an answer, but it's, he's asking, he says the IWM. So if we can pull up an IWM chart, trying to fill a gap from November 10th, how long does it typically take to fill a gap? And that's something you've talked about uh, a number of times. I mean, there is really no duration necessarily but typically, no. these things do happen. Um, does free fall take a week, something else? Just curious to your thoughts there. Right. So it depends on the instrument and it depends on what type of gap. So let's take gap gaps in the VIX. VIX is mean reverting. 95% of all gaps are filled within 90 days, 90 sessions in the VIX. Whereas a gap in an individual, you know that Apple, check this out, has gaps from 15, 16 years ago when it was literally gapping up, people like, it's what's this thing, the nano? No, you idiot, it's a nano. Well, what does it do? It plays music? I don't understand. The stock, those gaps, if you're waiting around for those gaps to be filled, the stock was gapping up. They were changing their entire business. That's crazy. We don't wait for gaps. They're epic gaps that are beginning of great runs. They're exhaustion gaps. But in terms of index gaps, um, and the one that's cited here, uh, it'll be filled uh, shortly. <laughs> that's my view. <laughs> All right. So, wait, guys. So, you know, Carter just mentioned the iPod Nano, and I think it came out. I like have two, one. 2003 or 2004. And I actually still have one, um, to be very honest with you. I might have waited on a short line for it. Is that something that you've ever done? I was at the Apple, uh, the 14th, West 14th store. Uh, on my, I think I just dropped my kid off at preschool and I went and picked one up and I was really geeked up about it. And it had about a hundred songs. That was like how much uh, the, the memory that it had on it. So you've never done that? You never waited in line at Apple? I, no, I, no, I, no, 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 that's the short answer. I waited online to get a physical to play football because I yeah. had to short of that. Yeah. And again, no, I mean, yeah. there's just not, I can't, you know, if magically, for example, John Bonham, um, reappeared and the Led Zeppelin was going to get back in their pristine form of the early 1970s and they were going to play at the Madison Square Garden. That's something that maybe I'd wait online for. Short yeah. of that, no.
Fair enough. All right, let's do a couple things before we get out of here. Carter, you've been talking, uh, you know, on Market Call, you know, you've been sending out the notes and you're doing a lot of great work on it. Last week, I think, or maybe on Monday, we did a bunch of charts bearish to bullish reversals. And, you know, we're trying to spend a lot of time and we were all kind of bearish on the macro. We can all see the signs. We're all waiting for some things to happen, which will let us get incrementally less bearish. Okay. Um, but there's a couple things that like we think have to happen. Okay. So one of them we've been saying, and our friend Danny Moses, all of our friend, he's been talking about some of these kind of buy now, pay later models, some of these ridiculous sort of fintech supposed innovations that were trading at crazy multiples, you know, a year, year and a half ago that are basically now down 90%. Carvana, one of them, you see the news today, the stock's down 95% from its all time highs. It's just fascinating that. Going into today, it was down 95%. It's down 35%. That's just math, people. They can continue to do that until it gets to zero. When you think about this, I mean, in your career, and you've been in the business for 30 years or whatever, how many stocks can you remember that actually go to zero? It's a lot more than people think, but isn't that maybe sign of a bottom when we're starting to get just stuff that goes to zero? Traders like to say that's a zero, but it doesn't happen that frequently. Right. And yet, which in here, some you can look these white papers up 95 plus percent of all stocks long term underperform 90 day T bills, which is to say, if you look at Fitbit, you look at GoPro, you look at Blue Apron, they send the food in the box to you. These great things, they're innovative. But remember, the people that are selling the shares to the public, why would they do that? Uh, the Mars family controlling the candy business, they don't go public. Yeah. And the Copra, Copra family, meaning a lot of stock issuance is basically trying to foist it onto the public. And I don't know, the guys who went public in Carvana, they look like geniuses to me. Not very savory, but uh, this, this can go to zero. A lot of stocks can. Um, it takes a long time. And some just go onto the pink sheets and muddle along at 10 cents, 12 cents forever. But that's effectively out of business. Foisted upon the market. I mean, you don't get shit like that anywhere else other than market call with Carter Braxton work there, Nathan. It's, it's, no, that, it's just tremendous. No, but, and again, we just bring that up because there was a lot of investor sentiment that was really excited about the upstart and the Carvana and the Affirm and all these things. And all three of those things are down more than, you know, 90 some percent. So it's, it's good to see an unwind of some of that unusually excitement um, around some of those things. Last Last one, before we get out of here, we can't do a show and not talk about Tesla because, listen, Carter, you've been saying this for a very long time. We will not bottom until they shoot the generals, okay? And, you know, Apple has showed some good relative strength of late. Just this year, you've been highlighting the fact that on a relative basis to the broad market, it's not making any progress. But, you know, down 20 or so percent on the year is much better than many of its mega cap tech peers. But this one in particular, Tesla, because it's been a cult stock. The valuations never made any sense. The CEO cult leader is coming unwound before our eyes on Twitter. Our friend uh, over there at Loot Ventures, Gene Munster, there's a rumor going around that um, Elon Musk can be out as the Tesla CEO. We've talked about this. I've taken the under whatever the time frame that you thought. I just think that, you know, Tesla shareholders have underwritten his Twitter gambit and a lot of his really bad behavior. And with the stock acting the way it is, sooner or later, they got to be done with him. And so the question is, how much of a premium is in this stock because of Elon? And when I look at this chart, dude, this is one of the worst looking charts in the entire market. Please confirm it. I have a little circle down there. That is November 2020. That is two years ago or so, a little more, when the S&P announced it was going into the S&P 500. The stock doubled. To me, you cannot have this thing not overshoot below that level before this whole market bottoms. Thoughts there, Carter? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been a one-way trade uh, to the downside, just as it was uh, for the bulk of its preceding history, a one-way trade to the upside. It's just not something to own. And day-to-day, -day, I don't think there's any immediate downside risk because so much has occurred. But again, it, it, the temptation always is, we all are prone to this, this is down so much, let me take a shot. The key here is to resist that temptation. I think, again, at Dan's point about Tesla's got a break before you say, I think that's true. I think that's true with Apple. I think that's true with Tesla. Maybe there are a couple other names out there that fit the bill. But clearly, I think you have to see capitulation. And you're starting to see it. I mean, we've talked about it a number of times. Tesla's been more than cut in half from its all-time high. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it over the course of the year. And I think, to me, it's a bit of a foregone conclusion at this point. I don't know... Uh, what the next positive catalyst is going to be. I'm not a hater. I'm just starting to read the tea leaves the way Carter and Dan are as well. And Apple, again, 
you know, it had that run up into the mid 150s seemingly each day now sort of chipping away to the downside. And I think you need to see capitulation there. And I think if you get both of those things, Dan, yeah. you're going to get that S&P, the levels we talked about. Again, somewhere between 3,200 and 3,400. We were at an event last night. Uh, I won't mention the names, but some people you'd be extraordinarily impressed with. And they basically were saying the same thing. Like, look, this becomes a math problem at some point. They don't see earnings much more than $210. Yep. You know, they'll put a 15 and a half, maybe 16 multiple on it. And you get to the numbers that we're talking about. So more and more people are coming around to this way of thinking. A lot of people will say, well, everybody's bearish now. It can't go higher. Well, for 10 years, everybody was bullish, and the market pretty much did nothing but go higher, Dan Nathan. Yeah, I'll just say one last thing about this rumor that's going around is, you know, Gene has pushed it out. Gene's a long-term bull on Tesla. He's been near-term bearish for months and months. He's been on our podcast talking about it on Fast Money. I'll just say this. If Tesla's board were to opt to, to elevate the CEO or the president of their China division, which the headlines over the weekend is that they're cutting production 20% at the Shanghai plant and boot out, you know, Elon, he'd still be one of the largest shareholders. That would be just a total panic. I mean, I'm just telling you, investors would not like that at a time where China's market share is below 10% in china of evs it's 50 percent of evs here in the u.s and we know that they're dependent on the manufacturing on rare earth materials and demand obviously over there i think that investors would not like that so who knows if that's a likelihood gene munster said he thinks it's less than a 10 percent probability but we're still on tesla watch all right guy that's it man that's it for me it's amazing how quickly 30 minutes goes by it feels like a half an hour it's truly remarkable i will just say this um I've said it a number of times, Dan Carter as well, playing in New York and playing for the Mets are entirely two different things. And that manifested itself in spades over the last week, as you saw one Jacob deGrom basically flee flushing to go to the friendly confines of Texas, where Aaron Judge realized that playing for the Yankees is both a privilege and an honor and decided to stay in the Bronx. That, my friends, are why Yankee fans are who they are and why Met fans toil in obscurity. But that's it for Market Call. Thank you, Carter Braxton Worth. Obviously, thank you, our audience. Thank you, FactSet, Financial Data and Analytics, powered by tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will be powered by the notion that EY from SoFi will be joining us at 1 p.m., no doubt bringing some wonky titled piece with her that I will fricassee. But hey, that's why we watch. See you later, folks. See you guys. Thanks. 